Um, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. It's the first of our series on understanding soils and leading to net zero. Um, just a bit of housekeeping to start with. Um, if you would turn off your microphones when you're listening, um, or we'll have to turn them off because it interferes with the uh, reception. Uh, the second thing is, if you could put questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom. If you can't put them in there, you can put them in the chat. Unfortunately, uh, I'll try and get them out of the chat, but with so many people in the webinar that they might get missed. So um, please put them in the Q&A section if you can. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the cultural significance of working and living on the on Wiradjuri land. And uh, I feel quite proud to um, be living and working in the uh, Wiradjuri area, nation. Um, now, I'd like to, uh, to um, welcome Cassandra Shaif to the uh, discussion today. Now, Cassandra has um, extensive knowledge in, uh, in soils. She did her, her doctorate, uh, well, she's finished university um, over 20 years ago, and she did a doctorate through Monash on, which was interesting and probably come in to uh, stuff today about soils and the interaction of soils and um, fertilizer and nutrition. So uh, I think you'll find it a very interesting stepping off point for this series of webinars. We're hoping you can um, build your knowledge. And uh, we think Cassandra is a, an extremely good communicator. So uh, don't hold back in asking questions. I'm pretty sure she'll have the answers. So I'd like to, uh, to start now with calling on Cassandra to um, take the floor. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you, Farmers for Climate Action, for hosting me today. And uh, as Peter mentioned, um, yeah, my background is in soil chemistry and uh, very much from uh, lab scale. So white coat, uh, molecular scale work all the way up through to, to a lot of farmer scale uh, research extension and um, practical on ground uh, strategies. So. Hopefully the presentation this morning is of value and um, yeah, please put anything in the chat box if um, or Q&A if there's something that would like more clarification. All right, let's see if we can get this working. Just so while you're doing that, Cassandra, there's a person's asked how to turn their microphone off if they go along the bottom of the screen in the Zoom instruction and um, zoom tabs they will see a mute button there and if they click that it's normally on the left hand side at the bottom thank you all right so good Peter that's good okay. great okay so this morning or this afternoon um, obviously the focus is on soil carbon and just like to, to kind of to flip the thinking a little bit on how we consider soil carbon in our systems so rather than um, you know, focus on the, on the carbon and then what happens from there, I'd like to consider this morning uh, the concept of if you do good things, then carbon happens. So let's, let's see what happens when we flip it a little bit. And we'll just see if we can get this to work. So first of all, I'd like to, I'd like to think that I think we need to give carbon a break. Uh, we have a common message from social media and popular press to farmers saying that if you increase soil carbon, then good things will happen. And in good things, the meaning is atmospheric CO2 reductions, greater biological activity, better nutrient cycling and water retention, etc. But the focus is all on, on farmers doing, um, you know, all you have to do is increase carbon. That's all. Uh, it's not that big, a, big an issue. Whereas I think, I think we know a lot better than that. So I'd like to think we look at things from a different perspective. So let's say if we do good things, then carbon might happen. 
when we think about good things, we're meaning management options that have a range of productivity and profitability benefits. So when we think about things that farmers can influence, we're thinking about ground cover, soil fertility, plant nutrition, deep rooted perennials in pasture systems, diversity, including legumes in cropping systems, and addressing our soil constraints. So that's things that are within our control as, as farm managers. From there, hopefully then we, we might see an increase in soil carbon and, and soil organic matter. Then there's all these downstream benefits that can't be directly attributed and influenced, um, but for which farmers seem to be bearing a lot of responsibility, um, which, which I think is not right. So what we've learned from a lot of years of research in this space is that what's good for carbon is also good for productivity and profitability. So it's not a either or scenario, it's actually an inclusive scenario. So I think we really need to acknowledge what we're doing well and focus on the good things uh, rather than always be thinking that we need to do more because society expects us to do all these wonderful things. So this morning, this afternoon, uh, we'll just go through what is soil organic carbon and soil organic matter, how is it measured, what carbon can do for you, uh, talk about climate and soil carbon, talk about some leaky wine barrels in our systems, how do you grow carbon and then obviously then how can you lose it. So first of all we need to think about soil organic matter versus soil carbon. So what is actually there in our systems when we look at decomposed material in soil is actually a whole range of different nutrients and elements. It's not just carbon. So there's phosphorus, hydrogen, um, nitrogen, sulfur, potassium, all these other things in there, which all very, in a very complex structures, make up what we, what we call soil organic matter. So when we talk about definitions of soil organic matter, and this is really hard because everyone seems to have a different perception of what that means, we generally say that soil organic matter is all organic materials in soils, regardless of their origin or their state of decomposition. When we talk about decomposed soil organic matter, that's got a consistent ratio of nutrients, which is really interesting and it's really something that we need to carry through with in this, in this presentation. So we know that for every, um, for every unit of nitrogen, there's 10 units of carbon. So we talk about C to N ratios a lot, carbon to nitrogen ratios. We know that in, you know, 10 units of carbon to one unit of nitrogen. We know that with sulfur, um, it's about 54 units of carbon to one unit of sulfur, depending on what um, exact system we're in. And with organic phosphorus, about 155 to one, subject to the minerals present. So these are really strict stoichiometric ratios that exist in soil organic matter all over the world. Doesn't matter if you're in, in China or, um, or Europe or in Australia, when we look at decomposed organic matter, it has these consistent ratios of nutrients. And this has been well documented by Clive Kirby from SARO, who, who actually traveled around the world and looked at different um, organic systems. So then there's this term humus that we talk about a lot as well. And unfortunately, this has very different um, connotations and um, concepts for different people. But when we talk about humus from a scientific definition, we talk about the fine fraction of soil organic matter that passes through a 53 micron sieve and is mostly bound to clay minerals. So in terms of uh, sequestered carbon or long-term carbon, it's really this humus fraction that we're talking about. Okay, so we know soil organic matter is really important, but why do we just talk about carbon? And the answer is it's because we can measure it, which is obviously highly important in our systems. So what can we measure? We measure total carbon by two different methods, either leco carbon or loss on emission, or we measure organic carbon through what we call the Walkley Black method. The different things that these tell us is the total carbon is a total amount of carbon in our soils. In most soils, this is mostly reflective of the organic carbon, but in some soils that contain high amounts of carbonates, so our um, calcareous soils in South Australia, for example, um, or have a lot of charcoal, this is other carbon that isn't biologically active and doesn't contribute to, I guess, carbon capture and sequestration. 
When we talk about organic carbon using the Walkley Black method, we talk about the amount of carbon in soil that's due to biological function. So this is the carbon that we can influence through our farming and, and um, environmental systems. So it's worth noting that there are no accredited laboratories in Australia that measure soil organic matter. So all the tests that are done are done on soil organic carbon. And we know that because there's these really fixed ratios of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus to sulphur, etc., that soil organic matter as a whole um, can be predicted with its mass uh, if we can measure the carbon. So we've worked out that if you measure your soil carbon, organic carbon in soil, and then you multiply that by 1.72, that's the um, correction factor that we use to then come up with an approximation of what our soil organic matter percentage is in soil. And the kicker with this as well is that we, we use 1.72 as a value, but this can actually vary from 1.765, 1.72, up to 2.0, depending on the origin and the nature of the soil organic matter. So different parts of Australia and different parts of the world may actually have different values for that calculation. So this is really important, because uh, if you get soil test done and it comes back as a soil organic matter value, that means that if it's an accredited lab, that they've done the soil carbon value and then multiplied up for soil organic matter, if they're saying that they have a soil organic matter test, then that test hasn't been accredited for use uh, and is in a standardised test across Australia. So when we're talking about sampling and analysis, we, th there's a few key things that we always encourage farmers to, to consider. So the first one is to use standard soil sampling measurement techniques. So do it the same way every time. Use a NATO accredited laboratory that's preferably also ASPAC accredited. And we talk about these two different accreditations because the NATO accreditation means that technically everything is done, is done well and is done according to, to method with, with um, standardised protocols and with instrumentation that has been calibrated appropriately. Labs that are ASPAC accredited have actually been compared to other laboratories doing the same test. So to say that they're within, within the same range of results is what other labs would give. So this means that the numbers that, that, that they're reporting on are more likely to be representative of, of the system. We also say to use the same laboratory every year because even labs that are NATO accredited, there will be some slight variances in um, the nuances of, of how they do the analysis. So it is preferable to use the same labs um, to make sure that all your tests, not just for carbon, but for your other nutrients as well, uh, are standard and can be compared over the years. We talk about sampling at the same time of year, which is important because there's, there's fluxes in our soil systems, obviously. And an example of some of the more dramatic fluxes are with our pH in water measurement, uh, which is a reason why we don't tend to use pH water. And we've gone to a standard of pH and calcium chloride to reduce most of this variance. But what this example is showing is that over the seasons, over the year, over the months of the year and um, in different soil types, so heavier soils and lighter soils, that the pH will change significantly over, the, over that year. And that's a subject of, of soil moisture as well. So that's an extreme example, but we do know that um, seasonality has a big part to play in our results, and that's also influenced by moistures. So if possible, um, always try and do your sampling when the, the soil is not saturated as a good start. And if you can keep it in that um, slightly moist to dry, then that's, um, that's ideal. So we, there's a lot of interest in sampling for, for microbial communities or soil, soil biology. And there is some tests available um, in the, that can be accessed. The challenge we have with these is that all these analyses for microbial communities are subject to high variability because microbes themselves are highly variable in time and space. So this might be something you'd like to do to get a snapshot of your system, but in terms of monitoring change over time in your microbes, it's, it's, not, a, um, it's not an exact relationship. So it might be something that you might do for interest once in a while, 
but I wouldn't be using those numbers um, as your key demonstrator of change. The other thing that's of high interest at the moment is soil carbon stocks for sequestration. The key with this is that sampling uh, for soil carbon and for carbon credits requires adherence to strict protocols. So this is a whole different kettle of fish as far as the sampling goes and there's a, a completely different methodologies that are needed for that. So before we carry on, I just thought it was worth doing a bit of a term check. Um, there's this phrase, there's this word called mineralisation that occurs a lot in, um, in our discussions and, and, um, and writing around carbon and nitrogen. Just wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page when we start talking about this. So mineralisation of carbon is the conversion of the complex carbon structures, so lignans and polysaccharides, etc., through to carbon dioxide through decomposition. So it's the mineralisation is the loss of carbon um, to the atmosphere. Whereas we talk about mineralisation of nitrogen, and that's the conversion of really complex nitrogen structures like proteins and amides through to very simple structures um, from ammonium and then through to nitrate. So becoming more, more mineral and less organic in nature. So I hope that makes sense, but that's something that's always confused me, that we use the same two terms and scientifically they have, um, they make sense, but in terms of our more, um, I guess, layman's kind of conversations, it can be quite confusing as to what they mean. So it's the same term, but just different endpoints. Mineralisation of carbon results in loss of CO2 to the atmosphere and mineralisation of nitrogen is the conversion of organic matter nitrogen through to plant available nitrogen. So in, in, when we do soil testing for nitrogen, we talk about mineral N, and that, um, that covers both the ammonium and the nitrate pools in soil. Okay, so we know, uh, we know soil carbon is, is awesome and it does all these great things, um, but let's just work through what some of those things might be. So the physical benefits of carbon in our systems, we talk about improvements in structure, improvements in soil infiltration, the um, water holding capacity of our soil, and reductions in soil strength, uh, which is all very you know, great physical benefits for both microbes and plants in our system. We talk about the chemical benefits of carbon, of increased cation exchange capacity, and the increased buffering that that gives. So this is really important. Um, so in our clay soils, with have, which already have a high cation exchange capacity or CEC, the value of organic matter in changing that is quite minimal because there's already so much buffering there. But in our sandy soils, it doesn't take much of an increase in, in carbon to have a significant impact on the kind of change capacity of that soil, which means that um, it can become more resilient to chemical change. And a key part of this is when we talk about acidification. So um, in sandy soils, uh, it doesn't take much volume of carbon to have a really big impact Whereas in our clay soils, um, that same impact might not be seen in this respect. We also know there's increased efficiency of nutrient cycling when we increase our carbon in soils. So because we have so more soil organic matter there, and we know that if we've got more organic matter, we've got more carbon and we've also got more nutrients, that means that those nutrients, um, and because we've got more nutrients, we've got high microbial activity, that means that those nutrients are moving through the um, organic phase into, into plant available nutrients at a high rate. So it also means that of the nutrients that we're applying to soil, that there's more chance of more of that becoming available to plants over the season. In terms of the biological benefits of carbon in our soils, um, organic matter itself is food, energy and habitat uh, for microbes and other macro soil organisms. So it's, it's such an ongoing cycle because microbes um, create organic matter through decomposition of, um, of plant residues and um, other detritus in soil, but then that itself becomes the, the food for other microbes. Because it's um, relying on biological conversion of nutrients from organic forms into, into mineral or plant available forms, we kind of talk about organic matter as like an osmocote for soil, it's that slow release nutrients. But if we can stimulate that cycling, that then means that we've got more ticking through of nutrients over time. 
We also know that under high organic matter systems, we tend to have a greater, um, greater amount of beneficial microbes in our system compared to pathogens. Because increased organic matter can support higher um, microbial diversity, there's a much greater chance that those um, that pathogens in our system become outcompeted by, um, by beneficials. So there has been a, a massive uh, focus on soil carbon in the climate change space and looking at uh, greenhouse gas abatement. And um, there's this big push that if we increase carbon in our systems, then that can have a big impact on climate. So there tends to be less discussion around exactly how this can happen. So if we take it right back to a basic level, let's look at how, how soil carbon influences um, influence our climate through carbon capture. So the key aspect is um, something that is not exactly new. Uh, we've known about photosynthesis for many, many years. So it's effectively the capture of atmospheric CO2 into plants through photosynthesis. And this uses light energy to convert that carbon dioxide into carbohydrates for plant leaves. And for anyone who's interested in, uh, in a bit of, uh, bit of chemistry, then um, yeah, just breaking down what that actually looks like in terms of the amount of carbon that's, that's captured through that. So then we get those, the um, photosynthesis, we get the carbon into plant leaves then the microbes decompose the plant litter, so when the leaves die, and that breaks it down into soil organic matter. So that's all good. Then those microbes die and they're decomposed by other microbes, which can effectively build a, um, a bank of, of carbon in our systems. So if there's a net accumulation of carbon through this process, the carbon from the atmosphere, we can say is captured or sequestered into soil which is a good thing, right? If there is a net accumulation of carbon in this process. The challenge we have is that microbes themselves, just like us, most microbes in soil will breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. And they'll also, some of them will also breathe out nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gas emission, or other greenhouse gases. So it's not a perfect process. And this is the bit that I find is, is not given the due um, appreciation that it should be, that we're not talking about a linear process from carbon capture into leaves through the soil. It's, um, you know, the way it's kind of described in, um, in popular press, it's, it's as if it's such an easy process and it will just happen. The fact that if we increase our soil organic matter, by default, we're also increasing our microbial activity and our, our um, mass, I guess our microbial biomass in soil, which means that the more organic matter we have, the more microbes we have. So by default, we can't have one without the other. The other challenge we've got and that microbes have got is that not all plant matter is considered equal. So we know that plant or any kind of organic material contains everything, every, you know, in terms of the different carbon structures that we've got, contains everything from sugars, amino acids, proteins, cellulose, hemicellulose, fat starches and waxes and lignans and tannins. Um, it's almost like something you read on the back of a pack, really. We also know that as we go down that list, we increase in our structure complexity and the resistance to decomposition. So if we take a look at the, um, the structure on the right hand side, which is a, the, a, um, a structure of lignin, that's pretty hardcore as far as um, consumption goes. So not many microbes are, um, are able to break that down. And it requires a lot of energy to break that kind of structure down. So we know that we have um, increased complexity of structures as we go down that list. And we also need different microbial groups to decompose those different structures. So now that fungi are a lot better at breaking down lignans, um, whereas a lot more of the bacteria um, come into the cellulose down to the amino acids, et cetera. So this is where it gets, starts to get interesting because we know that microbes themselves need adequate nutrition in order to break down this carbon dense organic matter, such as cellulose and lignans. When we talk about adequate nutrition, we talk about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. 
So this is really hard work. So the harder work it is, the greater nutrient requirements those microbes have to do that efficiently. So kind of like, you know, in a human equivalent, we like the protein shakes and the kind of the, the post-workout kind of, um, yeah, amino acid boosted funky stuff. Um, the other thing is that that hard work actually results in um, you have to increase your microbial population to do that really well. Um, so basically, you know, lots of heavy breathing. So we're getting lots of CO2 respired through this process. So the key thing to think about is that the efficient conversion of something like cereal stubble, which has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of, of 100 to 1, to soil organic matter, which has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 to 1, requires access to nutrients to offset that high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So the key thing there is we need a lot more nitrogen in the system to offset all that carbon and make that more efficient. And we also need to make sure that the microbes aren't limited by other nutrients as well. So if this isn't balanced, most of the stubble carbon is lost as CO2. And this is a key reason why um, in our stubble retention systems, uh, we've been retaining stubble for so many years, um, but our carbon values haven't increased, um, but they've maintained, which we'll talk about later. But it's just because we're losing so much of that carbon as CO2. So we've seen this in the field really clearly, and I'm sure other lots of farmers have, when we've grown a pulse crop after a wheat crop compared to growing wheat on wheat. So if you, if you offset, um, offset so a wheat straight into wheat, at the end of that second wheat season, you'll still see the residue from that prior wheat crop as well. So you'll have at least two seasons worth of stubble that you can still see in the ground. And sometimes you can actually pick up a bit of the third a third crop before that, if you say that was canola. In comparison, when we grow a pulse crop after a wheat crop, you know, in, we've used um, particularly faba beans, which have worked really well. By the time the faba beans are harvested, there is no stubble left from that previous wheat crop. And that's because it's not just the nitrogen that the fabers are contributing to the system, but also the fact that all pulses and all legumes, they're actually all their the whole plant, so the, the, the roots and the leaves have higher amounts of nitrogen in them compared to cereal plants. So through the season, as, the, as that pulse is, um, is dropping, dropping leaves and um, you know, cycling the, the residues through, you're already starting to get a, a stimulation of, of microbial activity based on that higher organic nitrogen. So this is, I think this is really, really, shows the, the value of, um, of nitrogen, particularly from organic sources in our systems. So let's talk about some wine barrels with leaks. So I live in Rutherburn in Northeast Victoria, a very uh, famous wine region. So I figured a few wine barrels uh, probably wouldn't go astray. So let's look at um, our most limiting factors for carbon in our systems. First factor, of course, is water. Too much and too little and not much is happening. Temperature and humidity are really important, with humidity in particular being linked to high levels of organic matter in soil. And this was done through the SCARP program, the Soil Carbon in Agriculture Research Program that was run over many years, demonstrating that humidity in particular had a big role to play in, um, in levels of organic matter in the soil, which also links in as to why the levels of carbon that we can accrue in our temperate systems is a lot less than what can be done in the subtropics and tropic regions. Soil pH, which is a massive driver of carbon and is something that I think um, we need to take really seriously in our cropping systems. So we know that different plants have different ability to, to grow under different pH conditions, but also microbes have different ability to grow and exist or function under different pH conditions. So an example um, we've got on the in the picture is with, um, with, with clovers that were inoculated with, with rhizobium and the plants that grew really well in a, was it in a high pH soil and those that didn't grow well were in a low pH soil. The key point there is that the rhizobium, 
that the rhizobium bacteria can't function under low pH conditions. What even makes that more confusing is that legumes themselves tend to have a higher ability to deal with soil acidity than the bacteria that they need to fix in. So the rhizobium tends to bomb out at a higher pH value than the actual um, clover will or, or any, any legume plant. So this means that you can sow a, a legume and it, it will grow and it may actually look okay, but the pH conditions may be such that the rhizobium aren't functioning and aren't able to, to nodulate and fix, fix in. And that means that the actual legume plant is mining soil nitrogen to grow rather than fixing its own. So this is a key reason why there's a lot of um, a lot of farmers who say that they they're not getting an end response after their pulse or after having a legume in the system, and it tends to be this this always happens in kind of marginal pH environments where they they grew the they grew a pulse crop or something it looked wasn't great but it went okay, but then the following year they're still having to bump up a lot of um, a lot of nitrogen in the system. So it's worth always, if you're not quite sure, just having a look at your nodulation and making sure that that's not the cause of the issues. So as we've got in this, in this table, we can see that bacteria such as rhizobium have a certain range of functionality in which they can, they can do their job well, um, which tends to be from about five to nine. So as we go into soil acidity, they start to lose ability to function. While things like fungi can operate down to about two, we do get selection of certain fungi as we increase in, in acidity, which means that it may not be the fungi that you want in the system that are still persisting as you decrease your pH. So really important. Um, and this basically, this means that pH is one of the caveats within which carbon can be maintained and increase. If your pH isn't right, then nothing else matters you won't get those increases or, or benefits to your system that you think you will. So I've spoken a lot about nutrients and I've spoken a lot about how organic matter has a consistent ratio of nutrients. And I've also flagged that if we have an imbalance of nutrients, such as a lack of nitrogen in the system, we're going to have more carbon loss to CO2. So a big thing we need to consider is that in our farming systems, we're not a cycle, we're not a closed loop as such, unlike our, our native systems, our forests or our, our undisturbed ecosystems. As much as we would love to think that we are and that we can operate in a full cycling kind of system, the fact that we're taking out nutrients all the time, every time we take out our produce and we take out alkali with that as well, which has an impact on our pH, it's, it's, not a, it's not a closed loop, we're a, leaky, we're a leaky system. So that means that in order to maintain um, our soil fertility and our organic matter, we know that whatever nutrients we're taking out of the system through agricultural produce, we need to balance with nutrients in, otherwise we, we move into a declining system. And as much as it would be nice to think that the microbes in the system were able to capture and cycle and um, provide all the nutrients that we need, unfortunately, um, in the Australian soils, we don't have the big bank of nutrients in our systems that other countries in the world do. So we have very old, poorly fertile soils compared to say Europe and America where the younger soils, high inherent fertility, and a history of high inputs. So we only have what we have in our soils. And even though our microbes can increase the um, extraction of those nutrients, particularly through things like pea solubilizing bacteria and um, et cetera, they can only take out what's there. And once that's gone, there's nothing left. So unless you're taking, you're putting in what you're taking out, you're effectively mining your systems, um, be that with, within any, um, any input system. So the only nutrient that microbes can create as such is plant available nitrogen. And this is subject to having the nitrogen fixing microbes such as rhizobium and free living end fixes. 
being supported by having a high pH and adequate nutrition. Now, as I mentioned, if you're not replacing what you're taking off, you're exploiting and mining your soil. So let's talk about soil type and time, and we'll get back to these a second in a minute. And obviously climate is a big deal, knowing as I mentioned that we have a greater ability to uh, build carbon in high humidity systems such as the tropics. So I just wanted to flag through this that growing, just like growing crops or grass, growing carbon requires management and inputs. It's not a passive process. So let's get down to the nuts and bolts of how we manage growing soil carbon. So I mentioned with our water, we need to ensure that we have good ground cover and good water infiltration. And this provides both the plants and the microbes with the best possible moisture conditions. As I mentioned many times, nutrients are needed to build carbon in our systems. And to build carbon requires the inputs of other nutrients. So if we're talking about low input systems, we're talking about mining soil reserves, um, resulting in long-term depletion. And nitri nitrogen under ideal conditions is the only nutrient that microbes can create. Soil pH, all plant and animal products remove alkali from the soil. As I mentioned, every time you take something off your farm, you take off a high pH product. So this means that we need, we need lime or other alkali inputs to maintain that pH. Um, unless you're in a, um, a deep alkali uh, vertisol or in a heavy cracking clay type things that have a really high buffering capacity. Um, a lot of, most of the soils that we work in are acidifying, even, you know, that, were used to, that used to be in a high pH environment. And what really scared me was a few months ago, I took some soil samples from a deep cracking clay um, that had a, a long history of rice production and that deep cracking clay was down to a pH of 4.3, which is something that I'd never seen before, which demonstrates that even our really well buffered systems get to a point where after they've been um, under intensive agricultural production for a long time, they will start to, to demonstrate acidification. So to manage our soil carbon, we want to optimise our water flow, we want to maintain our nutrient levels in soil, and we want to maintain our pH values greater than 5.5. So we need active management of nutrient levels and soil pH values. So in terms of how we think about our soil physical and our chemical framework, um, you could think about this as the house within which soil biology can function. So rather than a focus on biology, um, I would propose that we consider getting the big picture things right in terms of our um, soil physical and chemical environment. And then it's, it's like that saying, if you build it, they will come. Um, if you get everything else right, then that will create the conditions from which microbes can flourish. So there's a few caveats and thumb rules we've got. Um, as I mentioned, soil type is really important. We know that sandy soils can hold less carbon than clay soils. We know that low pH soils can build less carbon because of their impaired microbial function. We know that crusted, dispersive or compacted soils require amelioration before we can build more carbon. And we need to address our key limitations before focusing on soil carbon for all. So you have to look at what's your most limiting factor in your system for plant growth, and that is likely to be the most limiting factor for microbial um, enrichment and, and organic matter building. And each soil has a threshold carbon capacity that's based on environmental factors. So we're not looking at an ongoing linear increase, we're looking at more of a um, diminishing returns. And I mentioned uh, tropical systems can build carbon because they have a, more carbon because they have a higher biological activity. So it's all about managing your expectations within your systems. Talking about managing expectations of carbon, let's look at where the carbon is in our systems. So how, how we can support increasing carbon in our pasture systems is through pH and, and nutrients in our top and our subsoil and looking at mixes of perennial species where possible, so grasses, clovers and others. And really acknowledging that what we see on the surface, uh, there's at least that much carbon below ground as well. And we can optimise the growth of that carbon below ground by best practice grazing methods, so rotational grazing, cell grazing, etc. In our cropping systems, 
we really need to look at including a pulse or a legume in the system. If you can't, um, it's, chances are it's too acidic. You need to fix your pH first. And if you're in a soil type where a profitable pulse isn't, isn't an option, then it might be worth getting a bit creative um, with other ways to, to include a legume. If possible, and, and in mixed farming systems, rotation into a pasture phase is awesome um, to give the soil a chance to build up that organic matter and organic nitrogen reserves. And there's a lot of interest these days around intercropping and companion cropping options to increase diversity. Um, there's some really nice things that can be done with these systems. It's very much so around soil moisture limiting and what works for your system without increasing your risk. So it'd be worth talking to other farmers in your, in your region um, to see what other people are doing and what, what options there might be to improve. A lot of interesting cover crops. Um, summer cover crops may be beneficial over summer in our mixed farming systems um, and certainly into different climatic zones they can work. Um, un under um, southeastern Australian um, temperate systems where we, our rainfall over summer is very sporadic and is generally um, used as part of our, our water storage bank into the following um, autumn seeding. We're still working out um, what the fit for those summer cover crops are if you're not in a mixed farming system. So last thing I'd like to flag is use of amendments. There's a lot of interest in, um, in uses of compost or other organic materials to temporarily increase your soil carbon. The key with these is they need to be part of the strategic plan or there needs to be a commitment to continue the supply. So when I'm talking about um, a strategic plan, talking about adding amendments and then using them to stimulate greater plant growth and diversity, this then increases the buildup of carbon in the root zone and that can then be used uh, in following systems. If you apply an amendment, but nothing else changes, they will soon be mineralized as in converted to CO2. So it's very much a short-term short -term value. So for best results, you've got two options um, and using a bit of um, political um, wording, I guess, or, or spin, looking at ten, talking about long-term commitment, so repeated organic applications, which can have really good value over time, or a stimulus package to set up a system change that from then you can add value from within your system. Otherwise, you may be worse off than when you started. So just to flag how this works is, um, this is some incubation results that just demonstrate how much carbon can be lost from these systems. Is this is microbial respiration over time. And these peaks, the really big peaks, are when compost was added to soil. And this is showing that under ideal moisture conditions, um, microbes will really spur up and um, increase um, biomass really quickly with, with compost which results in a massive amount of CO2 lost. So if that isn't um, managed over time, then that can actually result in, in not much long-term benefit from what you're doing. So we've talked about how to gain carbon. So how will we lose carbon in our systems? Well, this is, these are kind of no-brainers, but just kind of to close the loop. So we're talking about soil loss and erosion, rundown of our systems through inadequate nutrient supply, um, which results in increased release of nutrients from organic matter and loss of carbon and CO2. Poor resupply of carbon into our systems and poor plant species collection or um, selection or degraded pastures. And finally, we're talking about acidification. So I've talked about that, about that quite a bit as a really key, key thing to consider. So the other challenge we've got is that even when you do everything right, you may not be demonstrating an increase in carbon. And this is just to, just to consider that if we look at the total soil carbon value that we're measuring in soil, and then we have soil A and soil B, they may actually have different pools of carbon in their systems, which means that um, some, some soils may have a higher amount of particulate carbon, which is really important for nutrient cycling and ongoing soil health whereas other soils may have what we call humus carbon or sequestered carbon, which is better for long-term capture, but not so good for, for enhancing the system. So just because you don't get an increase in that number doesn't mean that nothing's happening. 
So think about um, the other aspects to your system as well. And just finally, just wanted to show a pretty groovy picture showing that um, we can actually look at the different functional groups of carbon in soil across space and time and showing that um, even on a very fine scale, such as 100 microns, there's a lot of diversity in the type of carbon in our systems. So finally, you've done all these good things, so how do you know if it's working? So use GPS located sampling to track your soil carbon over time. Test your soil to maintain your nutrients and pH values. Check your soil growth, sorry, check your plant growth and your root growth, which means digging a hole, ideally. Looking at your end requirements, um, more efficient soil cycling will require less nitrogen. Looking at worms and other visual um, biology markers. And if your goal to um, increase carbon is through planting trees and they're still growing, then you've got that sorted. So finally, I'd just like to flag um, a program that I'm involved in called the Cool Soil Initiative, which is looking at um, increasing ways to maintain and increase soil carbon and soil health um, across um, cropping regions in Australia, starting at um, in the southeast and, and looking to move on from there. So if you're interested, just uh, just Google it and, and see what other information you can get. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Peter and the um, Farm to Climate Action, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, now, we'll proceed now to have a few questions. Uh, <clears throat> there's a first question from Brett about the electricity sector, but I'll discuss that at the end because we actually have another webinar on exactly that topic coming up next week. So I'll leave that for the moment. Um, is biochar a good thing from John? <clears throat> So biochar is a good thing. The challenge we have is that every biochar that's made um, is of a different source and goes through different process. And so not all biochar is created equal. Um, it depends on the system that you're looking to use it in. And if you can access it at economic rates and it, you don't have to go through any EPA approvals, etc., then it can be a good thing. Um, but just to class, all use of new biochars in even Victoria require EPA approvals. So consider the regulation stuff. Um, as a concept, it's a good thing. Okay. Um, next one, which is interesting, is does organic matter increase acidification or decrease it? So um, that's, it's actually a chicken and egg thing in, in some mm. ways. So we need um, higher pH values to maintain soil, soil organic matter. But a lot of the organic matter cycling is by itself inherently acidifying. So it's kind of, but to maintain organic matter, you need to keep maintaining your pH values. Um, it, by, its, by itself, it, it, high levels of organic matter can cause slight rates of acidification. But it's, it's something that you need to look at the context of your whole system. Because the other thing is that organic matter has, as I mentioned, its own cation exchange capacity. And so maintaining high levels of organic matter will then also increase your buffering capacity. So it decrease your rate of acidification. So there's a chemical influence of organic matter, which is really good. And then the biological influence of organic matter can actually cause to, you know, slow rate specification, such as through nitrogen cycling. Okay, um, and the next one uh, from Jay is, how does increased diversity through intercropping improve soil carbon? So the idea with that <coughs> um, is around the fact that if you've got more than one type of, of root system, in the soil, it's likely that those root systems are going to be um, exuding different compounds um, through root exudation processes, and also that their um, the roots themselves have different amounts of, of different carbon structures. So as they break down, you're actually increasing diversity. You then also increase your functional diversity of your microbial population, which um, is is proposed. That, that then increases the efficiency of that breakdown as well. So that the challenge we have in this space is that um, at a really simple layer, we, we know that these work, these should add benefit, 
The challenge is we don't have some really good data from Australian conditions yet to see this. Um, the other thing as well is um, everyone's version of what intercropping or something looks like can be slightly different. And within our different systems, again, it will be different. But yeah, it's um, inherently it's a, it's a good thing. Watch this space and um, probably come to some of our further webinars on this topic and we'll dig deeper into that. Yeah. Uh, can you please comment from David Martin? Can you please comment on the impact of herbicides on soil microbial communities? So there's been some really good work in this space by a group of um, micros up at New South Wales DPI, and um, I'm I'm not fully across it, but I understand that there's very limited impact of herbicides on microbes, um, and that generally then there's not a there's not a clear relationship if they have an impact or not. Um, but that's certainly not something that I'm I'm specialist in. Um, I'd be happy to send through some of the reports that there are in that space if that's something to, of interest. Very good. Um, now, another question here from John Marriott. While we should all endeavour to manage our soils to increase soil carbon as much as possible, in view of the complexities of measuring soil carbon, would it not be more advantageous to increase tree cover, easier to calculate? Do you have a comment on that or? Look, I think it's it's up to what works for your system. Um, I, I think we need to, as much as there's incentive schemes and um, and payments, monetization of carbon, uh, the real value of carbon I see is actually what it does for your whole system. So improving soil organic matter and even maintaining organic matter, which in itself is not you know, always easy, um, has all these benefits in, in, our, in our production environment. So, I think if we if we aim to increase, then if we can, that's a bonus. But at the same time, we're setting our system up for, for maximum productivity as well. So tree, if trees are an option, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, that's that's a whole different okay. um, Two questions really in, in one. What, um, how many um, testing facilities are there in Australia? But I guess the answer to that is quite a few. <laughs> Uh, and if I want to test my soil pH, how deep do I have to dig? So um, I didn't mention this because that's a whole new different thing in its own right. Um, but I would be really recommending that farmers dig at least to 20, if not to 30, to understand the, their baselines for soil, cut, soil pH to know where they're at the moment, knowing that um, what we measure in our 0 to 10 may not always be indicative of what's at depth. And subsoil acidification is becoming a really big deal. So I'd recommend at least, you know, five centimetre increments if that's what you'd like to do, but at least 10 centimetre increments down to 30. But if you're in a no-till environment, an initial measurement of 0 to 5 and 5 to 10 will give you an idea of if there's stratification of pH in, those, in that system, which may also be why pulse crops may not be growing like they should. If you start to get acid, take from five to ten centimetres, where most of the rosacea would actually be, be operating. Um, just as a little aside on that, for those who are farmers out there in this webinar, um, what I do on my farm, we have a spear which goes down about half a metre, um, and I just go to Bunnings because it costs about oh, it costs about eighty dollars to do a proper test. I go to Bunnings and buy a $20 pack, and then I can do quite a few soil tests of pH, which will give me a rough idea. It won't give me the exact answer, but it'll give me a pretty rough idea whether they're acidic or alkaline or where they are in between. So that's a simple, fairly cost-efficient way of doing it, if you're interested. Uh, now, in your carbon loss list, why did you not mention tillage, combustion, and pesticides? because I didn't have enough time. Um, <laughs> so the one thing I will talk about is tillage. Um, this is it's not as simple as what we like to think. Um, the issue we have is that if we don't do some form of mixing of our soil when we add lime, that lime doesn't move, which means that we continue to get subsoil acidification 
even though we've got this layer of lime sitting on the surface. So if we don't mix at least to the, if, if we don't mix to the depth that we can in our soils and that have, either have low pH or to the point that we start to hit soil issues that we don't want to disturb, such as sodicity and just general crappy A2 horizons. If we don't do some form of mixing of lime, then it's not going to influence our pH values. If we can't get that happening, we know that we, under highly acid systems, we can't grow good plants and we can't build carbon. So we have to, I think there has to be some compromise between very much strategic soil mixing and incorporation for a very specific purpose around liming. But then if we do that properly and we add the rates of lime that we need to bump those pH values up well, then we let that soil then sit no-till for might be five to seven plus years even 10 years until we then come back and do it again. So some soil disturbance um, is needed for that to happen. And we've also demonstrated that that kind of um, once in a, a long time, I guess, intervention in the soil system is not of long-term harm as far as soil microbial activity and, and carbon goes. It's the ongoing cultivation that is, a bit of, is an issue and that involves smashing of, of aggregates and removal of soil structure. So I think we have to think about tillage in sort of two different ways. One of which is um, is ongoing tillage using implements to create a seedbed type thing, and the other thing is very strategic, more um, so less structure disrupting tillage to get mixing of lime. So I don't think it should be a, a plus or minus. I think it should be like a um, you know like even a a lot of diets can be mostly vegetable with just a little bit of protein, so or a little bit of meat. So we need to look at how we can benefit that. Because if we don't do that pH stuff, then carbon's a, a moot point. It's not going to happen, and it's not going to be sustainable over the long term. So. Right. Um, now we've got a considerable list of questions, and we're never going to get through them all. Um, I just point out quite a few of them about um, acidity and pH and how to correct it and how long it takes and all the rest of it. Um, we will have Dr. Jason Condon talking on this subject either in a fortnight or a month's time. I'm just not sure with his timing yet. Uh, and he's going to go into the latest research in how to apply lime and, and different ways of doing it because he feels that the way we've been doing it for the last 20 years is not as efficient as it could be. So he's no doubt got some interesting points to make on all those subjects. Uh, we might close with the final question on uh, from Sebastian Nicholson. Could you please explain how fungal networks in soil to benefit soil health and, and plant growth? So there's a, obviously, you know, fungi is a massive, there's a, so many different types of fungi. Um, but just an example of some of the fungi that can be beneficial to plant growth are what we used to call VAM fungi and are now considered a muscular mycorrhizal, which are actually are endophytic fungi that connect into the plant and extend the hyphae through the soil and actually source phosphorus on behalf of the plant. So increasing the ability of that plant to capture nutrients. So as an example, that's obviously of, of high value. The other thing that's really amazing about fungi is how they can benefit the soil structure. So because their, their hyphae can extend way into micro aggregates and small spaces and through, through the soil, we can actually get this continuous network of, of biology through there. Then as those hyphae die, they then provide uh, little pockets of, um, of, of, of food for other, other microbes that can then increase that expansion and also increase the value of water flow through soil. So um, yeah, good fungi in soil are, are amazing. So, and again, you know, if you get um, work on your big picture things like moving uh, water into soil and increasing that initial infiltration, then you can also increase your ability of the microbes to expand, such as fungi. Thank you, Cassandra. And look, we've got some amazing questions here and I'm not sure what I'm going to do with them. I'm on forestry and grazing and regenerative farming, all sorts of things that need to be discussed, but we haven't got time to discuss them at the moment. So I would encourage you to um, 
to attend our future webinars. And also I'll try and put some questions, um, answers to some of these questions. They may not be as good as you would like, but they might give you a starting point to, to dig into the process. Well, Cassandra, um, could you help us answer some of those questions afterwards? Sure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sorry, Cassandra. Okay. Um, now, just going to put up, if it works, a, uh, where is it, that one there. Share, I'm just going to share, and it didn't work, did it? Did anybody get a picture of the webinar on, on renewable energy? We do have that, Pete. Anyway, you've got yeah. that up, have you? Oh, good. Whatever disappeared on mine, but anyway. <laughs> um, so that's on uh, on the 31st of March at 7 p.m. That's a night session. So the, the first question that was asked today about that, well, the answer will be in there. Um, now, I think that's about it. Uh, I, I uh, thank everybody for uh, coming and um, just remind you that there will be further webinars. Glad Before you we so finish up, can we let pass over to Emily to talk a bit about our organising strategy? Yes, we can indeed. I've lost that. <laughs> Go, Emily. Great. Claire, are you right to put up the slides? I am. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, g'day, everyone. I'm Emily, Farmers for Climate Action's Community Organising Coordinator. I'm just going to get the slides up now. Perfect. So thanks so much to Cassandra for a really interesting presentation. And it's great to see so many of you tuning in from right across the country. As you all know, these are really important issues that we're dealing with. So it's really, really good that you could all make it. If you enjoyed today's webinar, good news, there'll be more of them. Um, this was just the first in a series of Understanding Soils webinars. We don't have any more scheduled just yet, but we'll let you know when the next one is scheduled via our website, our social media pages and via email. We also just wanted to quickly make you aware of some really exciting new opportunities to get more involved here at Farmers for Climate Action. So Farmers for Climate Action is about to launch state and regional volunteer networks right across the country, particularly in Tassie, New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, SA and WA. So the idea is that the networks will bring together farmers and rural Australians and really anyone who has an interest in this area um, to improve climate outcomes in their communities and beyond. There's a really wide range of volunteer work to do. So there's work for everyone. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. We need all hands on deck and time wise, you can be as involved or as little involved as you would like to be. Joining one of our networks is a really great way to make a meaningful difference in these areas and to meet other like-minded farmers and rural Australians. Important to note is that the issues discussed in the webinar today will be a strong focus for many of these volunteer networks. So to sign up, um, feel free to scan that QR code that you see on the screen there. Um, it'll take you to a page, fill out the form. Alternatively, um, just go to our website via the Join, our, join Us page and, and fill that out. Um, next slide, Claire. Um, we've already set up our Tassie network. So if you're keen to be involved in the Tassie network, you're a farmer from Tasmania or just live rurally in Tassie, um, again, scan the QR code there. Alternatively, you can just uh, contact Ursula, who will be running the group at the email address you can see on the screen. Um, and yeah, they're a really great group of farmers. So please consider joining them. And finally, our Gippsland network. So if you're a farmer from Gippsland, again, Ursula is running a really fantastic network there. So feel free to scan that QR code, uh, sign up and someone will get in touch with you. And that's all I really had to say. Uh, back to you, Pete, to wrap up. Uh, very good. I'll just get back to the right page. Got it. Um, I guess that's uh, all we've got for you today. Uh, we thanks to Cassandra for um, providing a really interesting talk. Terribly sorry we couldn't get through all the questions and thanks to the attendees for attending. So, thank you. Thanks, Pete, Sandra and Emily. Cheers. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.